that this whole weekend is on God's economy in faith. And um, these, what we're concentrating on is this prepositional phrase, in faith. Usually when we read 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 4, and rightly so, we need to focus on God's economy uh, that, you know, Paul charged Timothy, told Timothy, I want you to charge certain ones not to teach different things other than God's economy. This and a, and a number of other scriptures in the New Testament show that the teaching of God's eternal economy is the unique teaching of the New Testament. But what we overlook a lot of times in our reading of 1 Timothy 1, 3, and 4 is these words, in faith, God's economy in faith. So God's economy can only become real to us in the sphere of faith and in the atmosphere of faith. So this, this is what, we're, what we want to get into. Um, we want to be those whose faith, uh, you know, like we read in the previous session from uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, we want to be those whose faith is growing exceedingly day by day. Of course, we saw in the last session that actually faith is Christ himself. When we look away unto Jesus, he infuses himself into us. This, this is a great miracle. When you look away unto Jesus, he infuses himself into you as the believing element to actually believe for you. He becomes the author of your faith. Uh, he becomes the originator of your faith. He becomes the inaugurator of your faith. And as you go on, he is now the perfecter of your faith. And the way he becomes the perfecter of your faith is the same way he became the author of your faith. And that is by our turning our hearts, our exercising our spirit of faith, number one, turning our hearts to the Lord so that our hearts would not be an evil heart of unbelief, but a heart full of faith. You know, in Hebrews, when it talks about an evil heart of unbelief, in Hebrews 4, it says, uh, you know, beware of having an evil heart of unbelief. It says this, in, in, uh, in falling away from the living God. You look in the note, it can also mean beware of having an evil heart of unbelief in turning away from the living God. So, so brothers and sisters, the way we, our hearts can be full of Christ as faith is by keeping our hearts turned to the Lord. So on the one hand, we take care of our spirit. On the other hand, we take care of our heart. We exercise our spirit of faith to believe in the divine and mystical facts in the word of God. And we also keep our heart turned to the Lord so that our hearts can be a heart of belief not a heart of unbelief. We need to pray, Lord, save me from this. I want to be a person who has a heart full of faith, full of belief. You know what that means? That means as you exercise your spirit of faith, faith, which is actually Christ himself infused into us, spreads out from our spirit into our heart to make our heart, our mind, emotion, will, and conscience a heart full of belief full of faith and these are the kind of people we want to be we want to be the faith people the faith type of pe people the faith people i'm so glad i can be with and around the faith people in new york city in new york city area and then one brother told me this is going all over the world so i'm so glad to be with the faith people uh in this time, and especially right now in this meeting. Now, saints, one thing I would like to point out to you, hymn number 535, which we sang, is a hymn written by Charles Wesley. And if you look at the crystallization study of the book of Romans, uh, Brother Lee has these classic messages on faith. He talked about the righteous, righteousness of God, the life of Christ, and the faith of the believers. 
which is the structure of the gospel of God, which can also be considered as the banner of God's eternal economy. Romans 1.17 says the righteous shall have life and live by faith. So in this verse, we have righteous life and faith, the righteousness of God, the life of Christ, and the faith of the believers. The righteousness of God is related to our judicial redemption. A Christ, Christ died on the cross to satisfy the righteous requirements of God on the cross. You know, Ezekiel 18 says twice, the soul who sins shall die. That is the verdict of the law. If you sin, you shall die. You know, God is completely righteous, but he loves us at the same time. Uh, even though he loves us, he cannot violate his righteousness. And the law says, the soul who sins shall die. Well, thank the Lord, he died for us on the cross as our substitute. According to 1 Peter 2.24, uh, he went up, when he died on the cross, he died as our substitute. So by dying as our substitute, uh, the, it says the wages of sin is death. He paid those wages on the cross. And because he is righteous, um, he has to forgive us. He has to forgive our debt, the wages of sin is death. He paid those wages. So the wages are paid. Uh, he died on the cross to satisfy the righteous requirements of God. Think not only this, listen to this. Not only did he die for us, we died with him. So the verdict of death was not only accomplished by his death for us, it was also accomplished by our dying with him. According to Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. It's almost like a, a double dose of of death to meet the righteous requirements of God. Christ died instead of us as our substitute. We died together with Christ on the cross. So uh, the righteous requirements of God were met. That was for our judicial redemption. Judicial means legal requirement, to meet the legal requirements of God's righteousness. Because God's righteousness has been satisfied, we have Christ as our righteousness. That makes us one of the righteous, according to Romans 1.17. The righteous shall have life. That's why Romans 8.10 says the spirit is life because of what? Righteousness. Because the righteousness requirements of God have been met, and Christ is now our righteousness. So because, based on that, our spirit is zoe. Our spirit is life. I said Zoe because Greek, in the Greek, that means the eternal life of God, the uncreated life of God, the indestructible life of God, the indissoluble life of God, which is Christ himself. He is the life of the triune God in our spirit. So we have the righteousness of God, the life of Christ, and the faith of the believers. It's by our exercising our spirit of faith, by our keeping our heart turned to the Lord, so that our heart would be a heart full of belief, full of faith, that by, by exercising our spirit of faith and by keeping our heart turned to the Lord so that our heart could be a heart full of faith, we can substantiate and appropriate God's complete salvation with his judicial redemption and his organic salvation. Everything that he accomplished in his complete salvation, becomes real to us by our exercising our spirit of faith. Now, hymn number 535, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to complete this thought. Um, this is in the Crystallization Study of Romans. The hymn is actually printed in one of the messages because um, I edited those messages, and I can never forget, um, you know, um, before the meeting, and this I'm not saying that because I'm anybody, I'm nobody, but my function was to, before the ministry meetings, was to sit next to Brother Lee. I had to be sitting there. And then when he would come in, he would sit next to me and he would say, Brother Ed, which, what hymns should we have? 
for this meeting. So I always had to be ready with a hymn or with some hymns. And of course, I had the outline in advance. Uh, but this time, I had the wrong hymn because there was a brother there, very, very precious brother. He's with the Lord now. He said, Brother Lee, I have really enjoyed hymn number 535. Uh, and he started reading a little, a little bit to Brother Lee, and Brother Lee said, I, I don't know about that hymn. Let me look at it. So I opened it, showed it to Brother Lee. Brother Lee was reading to it. He said, this is absolutely marvelous. And of course, he found out Charles Wesley wrote it. He said, we need to go upstairs and sing this hymn. And so it is a marvelous hymn. Uh, brothers and sisters, I tell you, uh, we exercise our spirit of faith. When we do that, we realize that what is impossible with man is possible with God. We, we're, we're all testimonies of that. If we could just go one saint by another, we were all impossible cases. Just think about, I think about my situation. I was in an impossible case. You know, when I got saved, um, my best friend in high school, um, he had gotten saved. You know, I, I found this out later. He had gotten saved. He got regenerated. Then he found out I, I received the Lord, and then I got saved, and he could not believe it. He said, I have to see with my own eyes to believe that Ed Marks got saved. So he flew all the way from Pittsburgh to Houston just to see with his own eyes. And he saw that this impossible case, Ed Marks, was impossible man. It was possible with God for God to dispense himself in Christ as the spirit into my spirit to make me one of his lovers. And um, anyway, that was marvelous. He was the first brother that I read the Bible with. Um, he, he, it was really simple. We were sitting at the kitchen table. He said, okay, and now we're going to read the Bible together. I said, okay. He said, okay, let's turn to this chapter. I was just like a little lamb. You know, I didn't know I was brand new. He said, okay, Ed, why don't, why, let's pray first. Then after we pray, you read one verse, and I'll read the next verse. So we did that. I tell you, brothers, just by doing that, I just got flooded with the Lord's presence. I mean, all of this was just brand, the realm of faith was brand new to me. And, um, you know, I like to emphasize one other thing, you know, um, from the, I hope we treasure him, number 535, number one. Um, you know, number two, uh, and I think Peter mentioned this in his sharing. Ricky testified first, and Peter. And Peter talked about 2 Timothy 4 8, where Paul said, um, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. Then he said, Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award to me in that day. Now listen to this. Not only to me, but also to all those who love his appearing. Now, when we consider that verse, when we, when we hear the words, love is appearing, we think of the Lord's second coming, which is a correct interpretation. We love his second coming. We love his appearing, but all it, but saints, I want you to realize it just, it, it doesn't only refer to the Lord's second coming because listen to this in Acts 26, 16, when Saul of Tarsus got converted, God told Saul of Tarsus through Ananias, he said, I will make you a minister and a witness of the things in which you have seen me. It's the past, and of the things in which I will appear to you. That's the future. So the Lord's appearing was an ongoing process for Paul until eventually, you know, when the Lord appears in his second coming, surely that's his appearing. But we need to enjoy his appearing day by day by day by day. I will make you a minister and a witness of the things in which you have seen me and other things in which I will appear to you. And we want the Lord to appear to us in this meeting. 
This goes along with John 14, 21, where the Lord says, if you love me, my father will love you and I will love you. Listen to this. And I will manifest myself to you. Now, it's one thing. Surely we have the Lord in us all the time. But it's another thing for us to have his manifestation. His manifestation is his appearing. When the Lord manifests himself to you, he's, he is making himself real to you. And that is a great, great thing. You know, again, I can never forget soon after I got regenerated, I remember I, I, I was getting some exercise. Maybe I was running or whatever. And I came back to my apartment and I sat on the doorstep and I was just talking to the Lord. And this seems very simple, what I'm going to say to you. But I, I was just conversing with him. I said, you know, Lord Jesus, I'm just amazed at how real you are. I didn't know that you were real, Lord. I thought you were just a historical figure, you know, past gone. But you are real right now. And, uh, oh, my goodness, that was just such a treasure to me. And so, saints, I just want to emphasize again. The definition of faith, faith is a substantiation of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, when we take that word substantiation, that means to give substance to something. That means that, um, that means uh, something is made real to you. It's like if I, if I, if I touch this Bible, I substantiate this Bible with my sense of touch. That means I give substance to it. The Bible becomes real to me. So we can say that faith is a sixth sense, a sixth sense. We have five senses, right? We can say faith is a sixth sense. But what is amazing and what we saw in the last session is this sixth sense in the divine and mystical realm comprises all five senses. We saw in the last session, you can... You can come up with even more verses than I did, that we can see God. Don't you want to see God in this session? I do. We can hear God. We can taste God. We can touch God. We can even smell God. We have a divine and mystical olfactory sense of smell. In 2 Corinthians 2.15, Paul tells the Corinthians, me, Paul, and my co-workers, we are so permeated and saturated with Christ that we are a fragrance of Christ to God. And we pointed out in the last session that the seeker in Song of Songs, she had a nose like a tower of Lebanon, which is a picture that um, when your nose is like this tower of Lebanon, that means your the, the intuition, which is a part of your spirit, your regenerated spirit, your intuition is very strong. That means you have a very strong sense of smell in the divine and mystical realm. You can smell what, what is of God. You can smell what is not of God. So that goes beyond reasoning. You know, sometimes we just don't have the peace about certain things. and We can't quantify it. We can't, we don't have any much logic behind it, behind it. But we just smell something that's not right. It's not right. And uh, anyway, I'll give you a lot of examples about that, but I'll just leave it there. But anyway, we need to exercise our spirit of faith. Faith is in our spirit. Doubts are in our mind. Uh, thank the Lord. Our spirit is a spirit of faith. So, saints, even our believing, you know, in 2 Corinthians 4, 13, it says, that we have a spirit of faith, and we believe, therefore we speak. Now, what I want to say here is we need to exercise our spirit of faith to believe in the facts, F-A-C-T-S, recorded in this testament. These are the facts. We need to exercise our spirit of faith to believe. And then we need to exercise our spirit of faith to speak the facts. Don't speak your feelings. If you feel low, listen, let's say, you, let's say you, I don't know how you feel right now, but regardless of how you feel, the facts are the facts. These are the facts. Don't live by your feelings, live by the facts. Exercise your spirit of faith to believe the facts 
and then exercise your spirit of faith to speak the facts, to speak the facts. If you do that, you have facts, you have faith, and then and after that, you will have the experience of the facts that you have substantiated by faith. So there's facts, faith, experience, or we can say facts, faith, and feeling. Don't trust in your feeling, trust in the facts, exercise your spirit of faith to believe the facts, to speak the facts, and then your feeling and your experience will follow, will follow. So uh, I know Brother Lee was, uh, I can tell you by personal experience, um, I just felt like Brother Lee was training me to, I'm not saying that I, that I graduated by any means, but I remember uh, on certain occasions, um, I'm thinking of two occasions actually, but let me just mention one and, and, and please don't, this is not a boast at all. Um, I'm just telling you, I'm telling you the facts. And uh, um, I, I just felt like this was part of Brother Lee's perfecting. I do not know why Brother Lee did this, but we were having a conference. He came into the fellowship before the meeting, because all the coworkers there. And I was, not, I was having a hard day that day. I was not having a day that, you know, that was in the environment was encouraging. It wasn't encouraging. So thank the Lord I got to the meeting. Then Brother Lee tells, I'm sitting next to Brother Lee. Brother Lee tells all the coworkers, I want Ed Marks to speak at every meeting. And the coworker who was sitting behind me, he said, Ed, I saw that when Brother Lee said that, your head went down. My head went down. I want Ed Marks to speak in every meeting. My, my, I, no doubt my head did go down because like, I was like, oh, no. You know, um, uh, anyway, you know, I still remember it was time for us to go upstairs. You know, usually I would go right upstairs. This time I sat there for a while and Brother Lee was sitting there. And before you know it, everyone had gone upstairs and it was just Brother Lee and I sitting there. And Brother Lee grabbed me by the arm. He said, now, Brother Ed, you're going to speak in every meeting, right? I said, yes, Brother Lee. He was training me to forget about your feelings. He knew, listen, his intuition was so strong. He knew what my feelings were. He was training me to, to speak by faith. Speak by your spirit of faith. Don't stand uh, with your feelings. The facts are the facts. And, um, you know, if you look at the book, The God, Man, Living, it talks about the Lord being a man of prayer, chapter after chapter. If you look at those chapters, it, it says repeatedly that the divine and mystical facts in the God-man living of Jesus, you know, in his God-man living, the divine and mystical facts. That's, we need to exercise our spirit of faith to believe in those facts and to appropriate those facts, to make those facts real in our experience. Okay, now let's come to the title of this message. This, this uses the term the linking faith, the linking faith, which is the faith of the overcomers. This is what we want. Now, brothers and sisters, um, I want you to, you know, I don't want the enemy to have any ground in any of us. Don't let the enemy lie to you and say, oh, you can't be an overcomer. That's a lie. Listen, an overcomer is not a super Christian. An overcomer is a normal Christian. That's why Brother Watchman Nee has a book called The Normal Christian Faith. He has another book called The Normal Christian Life. He has another book called The Normal Christian Church Life. In other words, the Lord's recovery is to bring the church out of all degradation back to God's original intention back to normalcy. What is the normal Christian church life? That's what we want to practice. What is the normal Christian faith? That's what we want. That's what, how we want to live. What is the normal Christian life? That's the kind of life we want to enjoy. Uh, so uh, an overcoming Christian is a normal Christian. So, saints, I'll just give you one small example. It is normal 
to say, Lord Jesus, I love you. I never heard anyone say this before until I came to my first church meeting. And the brother who I came with, he told me in advance, he said, Brother Ed, I want to let you know that, that you know, these people whom we're going to visit tonight, they will stand up and say, Lord Jesus, I love you. And uh, I said, wow, Brother George, I never heard of anything like that. He said, oh, yeah, Brother Ed, they really love the Lord. And so um, I learned how to say, Lord Jesus, I love you. You know, the more you say, Lord Jesus, I love you, the more he says, I love you too. Why do I say that? Because John 14, 21 says, if anyone loves me, he will be loved by my, by my father and I will love him. So if you love the Lord Jesus, he loves you too. He, if you want to maintain your romance with the Lord, you, you need to say one of the first things you should say in the morning. Lord Jesus, I still love you. Then throughout the day, I tell the Lord uh, that you love him. Now, we're talking about faith. Galatians 5, 6 says faith operates through love. How does the faith in our spirit operate? How does faith in our spirit get activated? Activated. It gets activated and it operates through love. So when we say, Lord Jesus, I love you, I want to love you with the first love today, I like to give you the first place in my spirit, in my soul, in my heart, in my body, and in my environment. I like to give you the first place in my family life, in my daily life, and in my church life. I want you to be the first in everything related to me. That is the way the Lord is our first love. When we love him in this way, then uh, faith operates. Faith operates through love. Okay, now let's come to Roman number one. It says, in order to be men full of faith, we need to see that faith comes out of hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, I would like to, I put this verse down here because this verse was a, uh, I've been praying this verse back to the Lord for a while now, but you remember in Acts 6, um, the apostles, they chose certain brothers to be deacons, and one of the brothers' name was Stephen. He's the first one mentioned in Acts 6, 5, and it says, they chose Stephen, I like this, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. See, when you read something like that, you can't let it go. You, you, have to, you have to lay hold of that fact. You have to exercise your spirit of faith over that fact and, and, and pray, that, pray, that, pray those words back to the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, make me a man full of faith, Lord, and make me a man full of the Holy Spirit. If you pray that prayer, it, it, the Lord will he'll clap. I'm, I'm so glad. Someone is praying a prayer like that. Uh, we just pray, you know, what he has spoken to us in his word. We pray that back to him, and he answers it. Okay, now let's come to A. A says the source of faith is the word. But we have to realize the crystallization of this point. There are three aspects of the word. One says, first, there is the written word of God, the Bible. And that's John 10, 35. But I would also add, saints, I should have added this, you can add it, John 5, 39 through 40. These are marvelous verses because the Lord tells the, the, uh, the opposing religionists, he says, um, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have life, but it is these scriptures that testify concerning me but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. So he said, you search the scriptures, that's a written word. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. The me there is the living word. Wow, this is really something. You're not willing to come to me, the written word, that you might have life, which is the applied word. We'll talk about this. Um, 
on, on dissect this whole thing. I just saw this as I was sharing. All right. The scriptures are the written word. Me is the living word. Life is the applied word. We'll see this. The words that he speaks are spirit and life. That's the applied word of the spirit. But saints, listen, every time you read the Bible, just pray a simple prayer. Say, Lord, I'm going to read your Bible right now. I, I just exercise my spirit of faith right now. And I come to you that I might have life in your Bible. I want to contact you as I read your word. And, and that is just marvelous. So first, there's the written word of God. That's John 5, 39 to 40. What I just shared with you, write that down. Two says, then there is the living word of God, which is Christ himself. Of course, John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Verse 14 says, the word became flesh and tabernacle among us. So there is the living word of God. That's Christ. Gen 3 says, finally, there is the applied word of God, the spirit. So thank the Lord, we have the written word of God, we have the living word of God, and we have the applied word of God, which is the spirit. So in Ephesians 6, 17, this verse charges us to receive the sword of the spirit. Which spirit is the word of God? How? By means of all prayer and petition. So we receive, when we receive the word of God, by means of all prayer and petition. In other words, you know, pray reading is not just a term. Pray reading is, it's a lot of things. It means you read the Bible in a spirit and atmosphere of prayer. It means you use the words of the Bible to converse with the Lord. Uh, you know, Ricky told me that Brother Benjamin Chen used to, you know, we have our corporate prayer reading, which is we repeat read a lot, which is appropriate. But Ricky told me, and I really like this, that Brother Benjamin Chen used to call our personal time with the Lord. That's when we have personal pray reading. I really like that, personal pray reading. This, this means a lot of things, but one thing it does mean is that we are talking to the Lord. We are conversing with the Lord. And in our conversation, we use his words to converse with him. And so we take his word by means of all prayer and petition, when we do that, his word that we receive by prayer becomes a sword, a sword to slay all the negative things within us. Let, let me say it this way, to slay the adversary within us and to slay uh, Satan. You know, Satan might be with the evil angels in the air. But he's also the, he's the adversary within, he's the enemy without. So when you receive the word by means of all prayer, that word becomes a sword. It slays all the negative things uh, within our being. And this is marvelous. John 6, 63, the Lord says, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words which I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Now, when we receive the word, by means of all prayer, when we when we come to the written we come to the written word. I'm sorry, every time we read the written word of God, we come to Christ as the living word of God. Then when we do that, we pray over that living that written word of God. Uh, in our contact with Christ as the living word of God, and then Christ as the living word of God becomes the applied word of God to us, which is the spirit. And of course, you know, uh, the Greek word for, for the word word in John 1.1 1, 1 is logos. Logos refers to Christ as the living word of God, or it refers to the scriptures, the written word of God. Now in John 6.63, when the Lord says, the words which I have spoken to you are spirit and are life, that Greek word there is the plural of rhema. R-H-E-M-A, that Greek word is the, is, means the word that the Lord personally speaks to you. The, uh, how do I say it? The, um, uh, the instant word of God, the personal word of God. 
It's God's word with your name on it. It's God's word with your name on it. God spoke it to you. That's why Samuel, in, in the book of 1 Samuel, uh, it says the word of God was rare. The word of God, there was hardly any speaking of God. But thank the Lord that raised up, the Lord raised up a little boy. Uh, his mother prayed for his son, and um, that's a name, that, that, that woman's name was Hannah. She had Samuel. She said, Lord, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. That's exactly what she did. She took him to the temple, uh, you know, when he was a certain uh, uh, age, you know, still quite young. He's still a boy. He hears the Lord speaking to him, Samuel, Samuel. He doesn't know it's the Lord. So he goes to Eli. Eli said, go back to sleep. Go back to sleep. You know, you know, don't bother me. This happens. This happens to you know, at least three times. And eventually Eli gets the message. You know, Eli, of course, was regrettably, he, he uh, I don't know how to say it, but you could say he was a backslidden priest at that point. But thank the Lord, Eli did teach Samuel a few positive things. This is one positive thing. He said, Samuel, when you hear that voice again, I want you to say this, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Saints, that should be our prayer in a daily way. Lord, speak to me. Your servant is listening. That personal speaking to the Lord, from the Lord, is rhema. And those words to you are spirit and life, zoe, the divine life, which is Christ himself. Uh, and when we receive those words, those are the words that we need to speak to the church and to the saints and to the unbelievers. Okay, now let me go on quickly. He says the written word, the living word, and the applied word refer to God himself. God's written word in the Bible becomes Christ as the living word who is applied to us as the spirit. The word of the spirit. The more that God is gained by us in this way, the more he becomes our faith. C says the crystallization of the source of faith is God in his written word, contacted as the living word, and applied as the word of the spirit so that we can gain the triune God who is able to call the things not being as being and give life to the dead. Okay, now let's look at Roman numeral two. Roman numeral two says, we need to see the effect of faith. Nothing is impossible to faith. Now, we just saw from the hymn that we sang, you know, nothing is impossible to God. Uh, with man, what is impossible with man is possible God. Nothing is impossible God, and nothing is impossible faith. So what is faith? Who is faith? Faith is God. Faith is God infused into our being which causes a reaction in us, which, which that very God infused into us becomes our believing ability to believe for us. Now, let's go on. And he says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Hymn number 535, written by Charles Wesley, expresses the effect of faith. Santa 5 says, let me no longer live but thee, indicating that faith always annuls us and reveals Christ to us. C says, only God is all able, omnipotent. Nothing is impossible to him. But the Lord also said that nothing is impossible to faith, indicating that God and faith are one. Now listen to this definition of faith, saints. I love this. Faith is the subjective God apply to our being. Thus, just as nothing is impossible to God, nothing is impossible to faith. I, I, I just, wow, that's awesome. Now let's come to Roman numeral three. This says the believers, the believing ones in Christ are the household of faith. Saints, we are the household of faith. You know, if I go to uh the Aaron Yankowski, Aaron Yankowski's home. Aaron, do you have any children yet? 
Yes, I do. There, uh, How many do you have? I've got two. You have two. Yeah. That, that's a handful. Even two is a handful. You know, you know, Aaron, I have four, right? Yes. I do. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Anyway, when I, when I look at your household, Aaron, I could say that's the Yankowski household, right? Right. Well, Aaron, it's not now you're not just part of the Yankowski household. You're part of the faith household. Amen. And because the Yankowski house, because it's called the household of Yankowski, that means everyone in your household, their last name is Yankowski. That's right. So what is our last name? Our last name is Faith. Amen. Aaron Faith, Ed Faith, Dennis Faith, Ricky Faith, Peter Faith. You know, Amen. our last name, quote, quote, is Faith. So we are the household of the faith. So A says this household is a big family. And the family name is faith. This is the home of faith. We may say that a certain home is the Smith home or the Lee home. But now we are all members of the faith home. We are members of the great family, the household of faith. This faith house is a house that believes in God through his word. Saints, I am so happy to be a member of the faith house. Amen. Hope you are too. Okay, now let's come to Roman number four. It says the believer's faith in Christ brings them into the life union with Christ. The word of God is embodied in Christ and realized in the spirit to be our faith. The believers live Christ and walk by this faith. So, uh, you know, John 3.15 says, everyone who believes into him may have eternal life. Notice the Greek word there is into. We don't just believe in him. The Greek word says, we believe into him. That means our believing into him brings us into an organic union with him. And John 3.36 says, he who believes into the Son has eternal life. Now, A says, to believe into Christ is to receive him and be united with him as one. John 1, 12 through 13 says, as many as received him, he gave them authority to become children of God. And these ones were begotten of God. We have been begotten of God. God is our father. Saints, we are not adopted sons. You know, I was just reading a, a theological book, and they were talking about adoption, that we're sons by adoption. And I don't, uh, you know, I'm not judgmental of the brother who said this, but that is totally wrong. I'm not an adopted son. I'm a real son. I've been born of God. God is my father. And God is Aaron's father, Dennis's father, Ricky's father. God is our father. We have the same life as our father. So that's a great thing. I'm just so sorry that in some circles they use the term adoption. There's no, there's no word in the Bible that uses the word adoption. It says that we have been born of God and that we are God. We are the children of God. We are the sons of God. You know, even one time someone came to our meeting, our church meeting in Anaheim, and um, I didn't know this, I, I, but we were talking about a certain person. I said, yeah, I'm sure glad that he, uh, that he was born again before he passed away. Well, I didn't realize this brother that I was talking about, he believed that you could lose your salvation. So I said something to him, and he said, well, you know, we had uh, this person, you know, he didn't have such a, a proper Christian life. So he thought that maybe he lost his salvation. I just said this to him. I didn't get into doctor. I just said, brother, listen, once you get born, it's impossible for you to get unborn. It's too late. You've been born. That's it. You can't get unborn. He said, wow, I never thought of it like that. That's true. And I think he got some help that day. Anyway, um, uh, let me go on. B says, this faith brings us into the life union with Christ, who is the embodiment of God, 
realized as the all-inclusive spirit to be our faith. Faith links us with the triune God. C says, as the organism of the triune God, Christ is the true vine, and we are his branches. We have been organically united with him by believing into him. We need to remain in this organic union by abiding in him. So Christ is the vine, we are the branches. And he says that in John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, what does it mean to abide in Christ? He said, he who abides in me, capital M-E. Where is that capital M-E? That capital M-E is in our spirit. Do you follow me? If we want to abide in me, we have to abide in our spirit because this capital M me is in our spirit. So in John 14, 30, I love this verse because the Lord says, the ruler of this world is coming. That's Satan. And in me, he has nothing. That means in me, this Satan, in me, Satan has no ground. He has no chance. He has no hope. And he has no possibility in anything. So saints, if we want to get in him, he said, in me, he has nothing. So where is that me? That me is in our spirit. So if we exercise our spirit of faith and we say, Lord, keep me in my spirit. Teach me how to exercise my spirit. Then we're walking according to the spirit. Then we are in him. And in him, the ruler of this world has nothing. That means when we are in our spirit, we are in him, we are in the divine and mystical me, and so the ruler of this world has no ground, no chance, no opportunity in anything related to us because we are in him. So we need to abide in him. That means we need to continue in him. We need to stay in him. Continue in your spirit of faith remain in your spirit of faith, then the Lord says this, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Again, that has to do with our spirit, because Christ, as the divine spirit, dwells in our human spirit. And these two spirits are now one spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Uh, he was joined to the Lord. Who is the Lord? 2 Corinthians 3, 17 says the Lord is the spirit. He was joined to the Lord, who is the capital S spirit, is one spirit, lowercase s, which means the mingled spirit. Now, apart from me, you can do nothing. Saints, this, this word touched me very much that Watchman E said. One time he said, two words are very precious to me. You know, I read that, and I, lots of times when I'm reading the ministry, I have to stop. Because it makes me realize, you know, Ed, you really don't know much. You know, what two words are very precious to Brother Nee? What would you say if someone asked you, Ed Mark, what are one of the, two of the most precious words to you? What would you say? Well, I, I looked again. You know what Brother Nee said? Two words are very precious to me. Utter helplessness. Utter helplessness. In other words, Brother Nee had the realization that apart from the Lord, apart from the pneumatic Christ, who as the life-giving spirit dwells in my spirit to make my spirit a spirit of faith, I am utterly helpless, utterly helpless. I can't do anything apart from him. Not only that, saints, you may feel well, I could do a lot of things apart from the Lord. Uh, Brother Ed, I'm very talented. Well, let's say you can do something. Well, whatever you do apart from Christ does not count in his sight. I will even go this far, and I'm going this far because the ministry goes this far. Whatever we do apart from Christ is sin. It is a sin to do whatever we do apart from him is a sin. That's very sobering. Now let's come to D. Faith is the linking of our salvation. It links God with us 
and links us to God. This linking makes us God men. He says we live Christ by a linking organ, and this linking organ is faith. Thus, Paul says in Galatians 2.20 that the life that he lived, he lived by faith, the faith of Jesus, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. See, there you have the word loved me. You see, so faith operates through love. We can see that there. Now, as says, when we call upon the Lord by saying, oh, Lord Jesus, I love you. That's calling on the Lord, saying, don't, you know, don't, you can't put God in a box. You know, when you say, oh, Lord Jesus, I love you, that's calling on the Lord. When you say, Lord Jesus, I need you, that's calling on the Lord. You know, let me tell you this. This is very bright. Don't say, oh, I'm so tired. Oh, I'm so wiped out. Here's what you should say. Oh, Lord Jesus, I'm so tired. Oh, Lord Jesus, I'm so wiped out. Because when you do that, you're calling on the Lord. You say, oh, Lord Jesus, I'm wiped out. Then he'll say to you, well, I'm not wiped out, Ed. You need, you, stay in your spirit. I'm, I, I, I'll be your energy. I'll be your energy, Ed. You don't have any energy in your natural life. But I will become your energy. Uh, don't use your natural gasoline. I want to be. I want to be your gasoline. I want to be your fuel. Um, okay. So um, when we say, "Oh Lord Jesus, I love you," He becomes the faith imparted into us, so that we spontaneously live Him by this faith. Living faith operates through our love for the Lord. He Himself, as the faith, becomes our faith. And this is the linking organ to link us to the unlimited, infinite Christ. Jesus, just by speaking a simple word to the Lord, I like this, in conversation with him, out of our love for him, and by a little calling on the Lord, we are infused with him. The infusing of Christ caused into us, causes us to have him as our faith, which is the linking organ that links us with him. This is the way to live Christ. Saints, I want to encourage you, converse with the Lord. Have conversation with the conversations with the Lord. Have hundreds of conversations with the Lord. Have thousands of conversations with the Lord. Eventually, when you put all those conversations together, that becomes an eternal memorial uh, between you and the Lord. And so we need to converse with the Lord uh, in our prayer. And Philippians 4, 6 uh, essentially tells us this, uh, which, you know, is a famous verse, you know, nothing be anxious, but it goes on to say, actually it's saying, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Those words to God mean in the fellowship with God. That means when you're in fellowship with God, when you're conversing with him, all your anxiety goes away. Uh, for some, for me to tell someone, oh, brother so-and-so, don't worry, don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. Um, anyway, I was thinking about something. I shouldn't say that, though, but I recently told, heard someone say, don't worry, you know, don't worry. That doesn't work to tell people don't worry. Tell people to call on the Lord. Tell them to converse with the Lord. Tell them to say, Lord Jesus, I love you. Then anxiety will go away uh, spontaneously. Okay, now let's come to the next point. We believers walk by faith, by our unseen God, not by sight. This faith links us all the time to our wonderful God. I says to walk by faith, by faith means that our walking is linked with God. In Luke 18, the Lord indicated that we also suffer persecution by faith. In Luke 18, 8, the Lord said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This means that we have to suffer all the persecutions by faith. Then we come to Roman rule 5. The way to receive such a link in faith is to contact its source, the processed and consummated God, by calling on him praying to him, pray reading his word, and musing on his word. This faith links us with God and imparts 
transfuses God into us. Then we will become men of faith. You know, I encourage you saints to look at footnote one of Psalm 119, 15, which I have on here. And this Hebrew word for muse, the footnote says it implies to worship. It implies to converse with yourself. How about that? When you muse on the word, what you do is you use this word and you talk to yourself. You talk to yourself with the word. Now, this is what David did in Psalm 103. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul. He was talking to his soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless your holy name. He said it again. Bless the Lord, O my soul. He conversed with himself. It also means to speak out loud. You see, when, when we heard the word meditate, which the King James Version translates that it, it that way. I don't fault them for that. But the most accurate translation is muse. In this modern day, when anyone hears the word meditate, they think of something done in silence. And um, this Hebrew word is not something silent. It means to speak aloud. To speak aloud. To muse on the word is to taste the word, to enjoy it through careful considering. To muse on the word involves prayer, speaking to oneself, and praising the Lord can be included in musing on the word. And musing on the word means that we enjoy his word as his breath, and thus we're infused with God, and we receive him as our spiritual nourishment. Anyway, you can look at that note. It's quite wonderful. Now, let's come to A. A says this faith links us with God and imparts, transfuses God into us to become our living faith. This is the faith of the believers in its progressing stage. B says the initial stage of faith is the faith that comes from the hearing of the word. The spirit was installed into us through the hearing of the word. Now this spirit or this faith which has been installed into us, stays within us and grows. Just like 2 Thessalonians 1 says, that uh, Paul tells the Thessalonians uh, that your faith is growing exceedingly. Now let's come to C. And I pointed this out, Romans 1.17 says that the righteous shall have life and live by faith. This verse reveals that the structure of the gospel of God is the righteousness of God, the life of Christ, and the faith of the believers. This verse can also be considered as the banner of God's eternal economy. You know, before we came on Zoom and I began sharing, uh, some of us were fellowshipping, and um, Brother Dennis Cooley, I, I talked about the beginning of Habakkuk 2, uh, you know, verses one through four, uh, actually, Paul, when he said the righteous shall have life and live by faith, he was quoting from the beginning of Habakkuk 2. And uh, Habakkuk 2, uh, I wish I could, you know, Dennis, maybe you could have it ready just in case. Um, you know, Habakkuk says, says this word, and he said something like, you know, that God wants it written so big that even he who runs by can read it. Is that true, Dennis? Yeah, yeah. You want me to read it to you? Yeah, read it, please. <clears throat> okay. It's verse 2. Then Jehovah answered me and said, Write the vision and render it plainly upon tablets that even he who runs by may read it. Amen. Amen. I may read it. And, and then as that word is, is, is the word Paul quotes in Romans 1 17. That's right. That's right. And, and it talked about the appointed time, right? Yes. And so this time is the appointed time. Right. And so here we are, we're running by Romans 1 17. It's like a big billboard on the highway of faith. Yeah. And we can all read it. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? We want the whole world to read it. Yeah. 
Okay, D says to have to have life by faith is the initiation. To live by faith is the going on, the progressing stage of faith. Faith in the second stage, the progressing stage, is the linking faith that comes to us through our contacting the triune God. He says, if you contact God, faith grows in you, which means that God increases in you. We all have the same faith in quality, but the quantity of faith we have depends upon how much we contact the living God so that we may have him increased in us. When God increases in us, the linking faith in the second stage grows in us. So Colossians 2.19 exhorts us to hold Christ as the head. That means to stay intimately connected to him as the head. When we do that, you know, of course, this verse is very powerful, but one thing it does is when we stay intimately connected to Christ as the head of the body, we grow with the growth of God. That means God grows within us, and we grow with that growth. And then the verse that I, I want to tell you this specific verse, 2 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 1, verse 3, that says your faith grows exceedingly. So when God grows within us, faith is growing within us. Now let's come to Romans 6. It says Romans 12, 3 says, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to be sober-minded, as God has apportioned to each a measure of faith. Now, if you remember in verse 2 and in verse 1, Paul tells us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice for the body life. He said, if we do that, we will be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Now, if our mind is renewed, we won't think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but we will be sober-minded. As God has apportioned to each one of us a measure of faith. Now, let me come to A. A says, to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think without a sober mind announce the proper order of the body life. You know, this is a, a very powerful word to me personally. Now, let me just share this with you. I don't have this verse on here. You can write it. You can just jot it down. 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1 refers to our having God allotted faith, God hyphen allotted faith. So faith has been allotted to us by God. And it says this faith is equally precious to all of his believers. So the faith that we have is God allotted faith. Saints, this, this matches Colossians 1.12, where it says that Christ is our God allotted portion. He's the God allotted portion of the saints. That shows that the God allotted portion of the saints is our God allotted faith, which is Christ himself. So, but saints, if we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think without a sober mind, that'll annul the proper order of the body life. Um, let me read on. God gave us the same faith in in quality, 2 Peter 1, 1 says equally precious, but not in quantity. The matter of quantity depends upon how we grow. If we grow today as the Apostle Paul grew, the portion of faith we receive will be greatly enlarged. You know, saints, again, I refer back to our history. You know, again, when we had, uh, you know, a turmoil in the past, I think of one, and you know, I love these brothers so much, but eventually they're, they weren't thinking in a sober-minded way. They, they were thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to think. Um, you know, uh, they thought, well, you know, there's, let me just say this. They're thinking about, okay, I have to realize in the body, by my spirit of faith, by my spiritual notes, by my spiritual olfactory sense. I have to exercise my spirit of faith and realize what this brother's function is in the body, what this sister's function is, what his portion is, what her portion is, what my portion is. I don't want to go beyond my measure. 
Second Corinthians 12, it talks about the God of measure. Ephesians 4 says that there needs to be the operation in the measure of each one part. So we need to do things according to our measure and according to what God has measured out to us. Now, you know, I had the privilege of helping Brother Lee and of serving under him and with him. And uh, he never claimed that he was anybody at all, never. Uh, but all you had to do, uh, you know, I'll just say this. I knew who he was. I knew who he was. You know, Jacob is standing there with Pharaoh. Pharaoh isn't blessing Jacob. Jacob's blessing Pharaoh. Who's greater, Jacob or Pharaoh? Hebrews tells us that the greater blesses the lesser. That means Jacob, who blessed Pharaoh, was greater than Pharaoh, who was the ruler of the known world. Anyway, that's how I felt when I was with Brother Lee. But these brothers thought, oh, you know, Brother Lee, he just he just one of us. We can do what he does. Sorry. you can't. Listen, if you're with Noah, and you try to build a speedboat in your backyard while Noah's building the ark, that speedboat is going to sink. If you're with Noah, you need to realize Noah's the minister of this age. I better go to Noah and say, hey, Noah, what can I do to help? Can you give me a hammer and some nails or I'll do whatever. Whatever I can do to help you carry out the ministry of this age as the minister of this age. And so, you know, and brothers, if we don't do that, it annuls the proper order of the body life. I had to tell a brother recently, I said, brother, you have to honor the elders in your locality. Um, anyway, you know, he has someone outside the eldership. Um, what should we pray in the prayer meeting? Well, that... Anyway, I, I, I'm going to try to cover the situation, but I told that brother in a, in a very good way. I said, brother, did you check with the elders before you asked that brother what the what the saints in a prayer meeting at church in Anaheim should pray? He said, no. I said, brother, you should have. You should always check with the elders. Um, he said, Ed, are you are you saying to me that it's not it wasn't wrong for me to ask that brother? But the proper way for me to do things would have been to ask the, the elders. And then if the elders directed me to check with that brother, then it's fine. I said, that's absolutely what I'm saying. That's absolutely what I'm saying. The elders in a locality are directly responsible to God for that locality. It's a very serious responsibility. And so we have to honor them. The elders don't have a position. You know, this is something organic. You know, when I come in my home, I don't have a sign on me that says dad, D-A-D. Everybody knows I'm the dad. Even my dog knows I'm the dad um, because that's who I am in life. So uh, my point is, is if you're not sober minded, you don't know the proper order of the body life. Thank the Lord for the leading brothers. I love the, I love the leading brothers in New York City. And uh, I love all you saints there. Uh, and, um, but anyway, we need to realize we need to be sober minded. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Um, okay. Uh, okay, let me go to C. God's apportioning. Okay, the last point says how much faith we have depends upon God's apportioning. She says, God's apportioning depends upon our attitude. If we're not sober-minded, God would not increase his apportioning of faith to us, and he would probably even decrease it. That's very sobering. Now, let's come to Roman number seven. Faith is the indicator of the believer's life in the enjoyment of the divine trinity. Okay, now there's lots of verses here which I don't have time to get into, but I would like to say a word, you know, if there's some newer ones here, I want you to realize that everything we say here is from the Bible. We don't want to say one word that doesn't come from this Bible. And we, 
We love the Bible. We love the Lord Jesus. And we love the Bible. And so um, all these verses substantiate all these points here. Now let's come to A. A says, Paul remembered the Thessalonians' work of faith. Their faith became such an indicator of their life and the enjoyment of Christ that they became a pattern to all the believing ones. Now, these are new believers. Imagine that. These new believers, they became a pattern to all the believing ones because of their faith. B says, faith is not for us to accomplish great things. Faith is for us to live God, to express God, and minister God to people. Faith is not for us to perform something great. Faith is, is, is to live God and annul ourselves, annul ourselves. C says, in all that we are and do, people must see, I love this, people must see that we are enjoyers of God. Saints, you should, I, I know you're all muted, but I hope you're saying amen to this. We need to be enjoyers of God. Everybody should know we're an enjoyer of God. That doesn't mean you come down the street and say, hey, I'm an enjoyer of God. And people look at you and say, what is he so happy about? You know, why is he happy? Everything's miserable around here, but he's happy. Something's different about this guy. Well, what's different about it? I'd like to know. So I'll go ask uh, Ricky and Peter, hey, why are you so happy? And say, you know why I'm so happy, Ed Marks? I'm so happy because I'm enjoying God. That's why we're happy. Okay, so people have to see we're enjoyers of God. We should always bear an indication that we are nothing, but God in Christ is everything to us. We need to be those who, like Watchman Nee, pay more attention to life than work. Now, Let's come to Roman numeral eight. This says the linking faith is the divine requirement for the overcomers to meet Christ in his triumphant return. This is based on Luke 18, eight, where the Lord says, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And he says, may the Lord be merciful to us that when he comes back, he can find us as the believing ones who always trust in him, not in ourselves, and who always have no assurance in ourselves. You know, saying 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9 is, is very precious to me. Uh, Paul says here, he says, uh, he tells the Corinthians, I, I don't want you to be ignorant of the affliction which befell us in Asia. Listen to this. We were excessively burdened beyond our power. Saints, all of us have been in environments and circumstances that were beyond our power. There was no way we could handle it. The Lord puts, puts us in situations that we cannot handle in our natural life, with our natural ability, with our natural strength. You know, it's beyond our power. Why did Paul, why did the Lord put Paul and his co-workers in an environment that was beyond their power. Now, the environment was so bad that Paul said this, so that we despaired even of living. Now, if you look up despair in the dictionary, that's, that's much stronger than depressed. Paul didn't say we, we were depressed even of living. He said we despaired. You know, to despair means hope is over. And so he said we despaired even of living. But thank the Lord. In Paul's despair, he had a treasure in his spirit. Hallelujah. You can't get rid of that treasure in your earthen vessel, even if you're at the point of despair. So Paul goes on to say, indeed, we ourselves had the response of death in ourselves, that we should not base our confidence on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. You can also translate it this way. You can say that we should not trust in ourselves, but trust in God who raises the dead. Our trust is not in us. God was training us by putting us in that environment because in ourselves, we had no way out. But when we contacted him as the resurrecting triune God, 
in our spirit. Uh, resurrection is what brings us out of everything, right? Uh, you know, in Acts 2, um, when Peter was preaching the gospel, I think it might be verse 24, Peter says, it was impossible for him to be held by death, right? It's impossible for this living person, Christ as the spirit in your spirit, making your spirit a spirit of faith. It's impossible for him to be held down by death. So the Lord was training them. Don't trust in yourself, trust in God. You know, our, on our coins, thank the Lord, we still have trust in God. Am I right? I hope it's, it better stay there. Trust in God. Well, it's easy to have that on a coin, but, and we might say, well, I trust in God. But when you're in a situation that desperate as Paul was in, your trust in God is put to the test. And uh, thank the Lord, you know, the Lord is so merciful to us. He is a God who never lets us go. He's a God who holds on to us and never lets go. And so, thank the Lord, we can, we can trust in God who raises the dead. Uh, now, let's come to being. J.N. Darby once said this. I've got this, I've got this quote on my, you know, where I, where I do the outlines, where I study the word. Well, let me say this. Look, uh, my, my bedroom is also my study. The reason why is because I have a chronic illness, started to get horizontal at times. But with the kind of labor I do in the Lord, I can still labor in the Lord while I'm horizontal because I have to do a lot of reading. So you don't have to read the minutes, you have to read the Bible. I can pray horizontally. You know, if you have to be horizontal, the Lord will work it out. How do I say this? You know, the Lord, you can't put God in a box. You think you can't pray horizontally? Believe me, you can pray. If he puts you in a horse, if you're in a horizontal position and you can't help it, he he's gonna teach you how to contact him in that in, in this position. Okay, anyway. As soon as I wake up, I look to my right, and there's a frame there. It says, give them food. Then I look to the left, there's another frame. It says, give them food. Then I go to my desk. There's another, there's another uh, frame. It says, give them food. Then I look to my left, and there's another frame that has this quote on it of J. and Darby. Oh, the joy. Saints, oh, the joy. Don't you want this joy? Oh, the joy. It's not just the joy. Darby said, oh, the joy. And there's a special joy of having nothing being nothing, seeing nothing, but a living Christ in glory. And let me read it this way. Oh, the joy of having nothing, but a living Christ in glory. Oh, the joy of being nothing, but a living Christ in glory. I don't want to be anything. I just want to be Christ. I just want to live Christ. I just want to magnify Christ. I want, when people see me, I want them to see Christ. Oh, the joy of seeing nothing, but a living Christ in, in glory. And oh, the joy of being careful for nothing but his interest down here. This is faith. Okay, now we come to C. C says, we are not for big miracles, big works, or big careers. The Lord is expecting to find at his coming back the ones who live by the linking faith. Christ expects to find us as his hidden overcomers. Remember in Romans 11, 3 through 4, uh, uh, Paul quotes Elijah, where Elijah says, Lord, they've killed your prophets, torn down your altars. I'm the only one that's left. And then here's what Paul says. I like this. He says, what does the divine answer say to him? Hallelujah for the divine answer. What does the divine answer say to him? I have reserved for myself. 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You know, saints, when we read that, we should pray, Lord, reserve me for yourself. I want to be reserved for you exclusively. You see, the reservation 
you know, it's almost like a reservation on a table. You know, you, they, I don't know what the, some restaurants they put reserved. Maybe a sign on you should be reserved for the triune God. You know, we're just reserved for him. And saints, this matter of being is hidden overcomers. You may have never noticed this verse before. This is Psalm 83, 3b. Uh, it, Psalm 83, 3a said, uses the word your people, God's people. And it says, you know, the opposers, they conspire against your hidden ones. You are capital Y. Your hidden ones. We want to be one of his hidden ones. That is to be one of his hidden overcomers. D says, the believers who live an overcoming and exalting life by the linking faith will be found by Christ at his return as the treasures ready to receive the salvation of their souls as the end result of their faith. He says, today, we are making ourselves ready to be his bride. To make ourselves ready is to become an overcomer who is always linked by the living faith with the triune God. You know, um, Revelation 19 talks about the marriage dinner of the Lamb, and it says, his wife has made herself ready. Saints, we need to cooperate with our wonderful Lord, whom we love more than anyone or anything, so that in oneness with him and by him, through him, and with him, we make ourselves ready to be married to him. Okay, now let's come to Roman numeral nine, and we're almost at the end right now. We have plenty of time for sharing. Nine says, the overcomers who live by faith will be rewarded by Christ with the co-kingship and top enjoyment of the divine life with him in the millennium. The Lord will then say to his overcomers, and I shared this in the last session, well done, good and faithful slave. Enter into the joy of your master. I just pray that all of us hear that when we appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well done, good and faithful slave. Enter into the joy of your master. Now listen to this. In Philippians 3.14, Paul said, I pursue toward the goal for the prize to which God in Christ Jesus has called me upward. Now, now this verse is very powerful to me because of what the footnote says. What is, our, what is the goal? Our goal every day is the fullest enjoyment of Christ. Our goal every day is the fullest gaining of Christ. So why wouldn't we pray that? Lord, I pray that I would fully enjoy you today. Lord, I pray I would fully gain you today. For the prize, what is the prize? The prize is the uttermost enjoyment of Christ in the millennial kingdom. That is our prize. So when it says enter into the joy of your master, that means you have the fullest enjoyment of Christ in this age, and you get tons and tons and tons more enjoyment of Christ for a thousand years. That's what that means. Okay, finally, we come to Roman rule 10. Wonderful utterance here because it's, it's not mine. You know where it comes from. By this linking faith, we are linked to God in Christ to participate in all that the all-inclusive Christ is, has, and has attained to for the producing of the organic members of Christ to constitute and build up his organic body, which will consummate in the new Jerusalem as the enlargement and expression of the eternal triune God and his unlimited glory in the mysterious mingling of divinity with humanity for eternity. This is the eternal fulfillment of Romans 1.17. The righteous shall have life and live by faith, which is the banner of God's eternal economy, and that is the linking faith, that is the 